Hello and welcome to the State of Tech podcast for December 17th, 2011. This is Episode 7, Technology in Mathematics. Uh, the State of Tech podcast is a bi-weekly podcast covering educational technology. The show is designed for anyone in education, from teachers to principals to technology directors, wanting to explore how technology can be used to improve teaching and learning. Um, each week, uh, or each episode, we uh, talk about the latest news, our awesome things of the week, and then we dive in deep to a particular topic for each episode, this one being technology in mathematics. So we're glad to have you here with us um, and uh, glad to have um, our normal uh, hosts as well. Um, Eric G is our uh, first normal host. How you doing, Eric? Great, great. It is uh, still out for debate whether or not I am normal. So uh, just uh, the doctors make me say that. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> Well, sorry, our regular host, is that fair, or will that lead to another Yes, joke? legally, legally, that is acceptable. Okay, okay, that is our regular host. Uh, another one of our regular co-hosts is uh, a little bit under the weather today, but uh, Sean Beavers is with us. Sean, how you doing? I'm, I'm doing all right, and uh, I really don't sound like this. Uh, this is actually a filter that Eric applied uh, after we recorded the podcast, so uh, thanks, Eric. <laughs> Yeah, uh, Sean is a little bit deeper voice there than he normally is. Uh, we are fortunate and uh, really happy to have uh, two guests with us today. I'll give them a, a moment here to uh, tell just a little bit about themselves as far as where they're from and uh, what they teach and what grade levels. Um, our first uh, guest host today is Brian Foudy. Brian? Hi, how you doing? Where, where are you from and what do you teach and so forth? Uh, I'm from the Trumbull Current Technical Center in Warren, Ohio. I teach a class called Integrated 3, and it's uh, equivalent to Algebra 2 and Statistics and Probability and some Geometry in Warren, Ohio. Fantastic. Thanks. Um, Brian is sort of representing our um, high school end of our guests for today. Uh, our, second jet, our second guest is uh, Julie Garcia. Julie? Hi, my name is Julie Garcia, and I'm a seventh grade pre-algebra teacher in San Diego, California. So how about that? We've got, see, now, so it's what, uh, three hours earlier there? We appreciate you uh, getting up a little bit earlier for this today. Thank you so much. Um, so Julie is sort of representing our, our, our middle uh, school um, guest for this week. And we were going to have a third guest. Uh, his name is uh, Jeff Berkebile. And Jeff was not able to be on the show today, but he's our elementary representative. But he provided me with lots and lots and lots of great information that I'll be sharing. The odd thing is Jeff actually actually is in the building. That's the weird thing. He is a wrestling coach, and uh, I record this here at, at Hoover High School, and that is where the wrestling invitational is taking place. So Jeff is actually just out that door and down the hall, but uh, he's probably having somebody spit in a cup or something like that right now. So uh, he cannot be with us today, but we will share his information. Uh, so that is our amazing panel uh, for our episode today on tech and math. But before we get into all that, we, as always, start off with some news. Uh, Eric G is going to help us out with our news today. Eric, what's happening? Fantastic. Yes, lots of, uh, well, four, four major uh, news topics here. First off, we'll talk about uh, some news on e-tech. Um, E-rate workshops um, offered. Uh, they're offering e-rate workshops on technical assistance for technology coordinators uh, for applying for the federal e-rate technical assistance program. Um, so we have a link in our show notes to read more about that. Uh, we also uh, received word that their advanced rate uh, registration is now available for the tech conference. Um, the discount, uh, Eric tells me, is not as great as the early bird discount, but it is uh, it is still a discount. Uh, and again, the eTech conference is February thirteenth through the fifteenth in the Columbus. Whoops, in the uh, Columbus area. Uh, I'm all over the road there. And uh, again, there's more notes, uh, more information on our show notes there. And in addition to that, eTech is asking ways for us to share our success stories with them. Um, much like we do here at the State of Tech, uh, they would like to know some information about, you know, administrators, teachers, students, you know, great things going on in the state of Ohio. So uh, they have added a survey uh, through SurveyMonkey, and the link again is in our show notes, for you to fill out and just uh, let them know. Um, lastly, the Ohio 
Goes Google conference is May 10th, and uh, I presented that last year, and Eric Kurtz, I believe you did as well, right? And Sean as well, that's, uh, that's coming up, and more information will follow on that. Sean, do you have anything you would like to add on that conference? Uh, no, just be looking, like Eric said, for more information. It's going to be at the convention center this year. Uh, last year, I believe, it was at the Hyatt Regency, so I'm, I'm really hoping we have as uh, great a turnout as last year. Yep. It was a fun time last year. I enjoyed it. Yeah, that really was a great uh, conference. I think they were a little caught off guard by how many people uh, signed up for it. It was a fantastic conference on Google Apps for Education in Ohio. So the fact that they're holding it at the convention center this year, uh, I did. We could really, really see a very large turnout for that. So keep an eye out for that one coming up May 10th. Um, well, that's it for our, our, our news items. Uh, another thing we love to do is do our awesome thing of the week, something that uh, in the last two weeks we've come across that we thought, hey, well, this is really cool. We ought to, we ought to share this. Um, Sean, I'm going to go ahead and uh, start with you. Uh, what was your uh, thing that you've come across? Sure. Uh, Chrome 16 just recently came out, and, and recently, I think it was last week, um, and uh, one of the things you can do is you can sign into multiple Google accounts, or you can sync multiple Google accounts with the Chrome browser. So it's very easy to do. Uh, you can either click on the wrench in the right-hand corner of your browser, or you can click in the top left-hand corner next to where you'll see your very first tab, and there'll be an icon for each user. Um, and if I click on that, I can either sign into one of the accounts um, that I already have set up, or I can click on new user, and I can add somebody else. Um, <clears throat> So it, it works very well. You know, it's nice to be able to sign in out on uh, different accounts and you know have your web apps there and your extensions. The only thing that uh, I see as a drawback is not password protected in any way. So if you are signed in uh, to somebody else's Chrome browser, you know they can switch to your account um, or you can switch to their account. There's really um, not a level. You know, there's no security measures at this time. But again, nice feature. If I'm out somewhere. I can sign into my Chrome browser without signing somebody else out and have all of my extensions, web apps, and, and passwords ready. All right. Thanks very much. Um, I think it's also worth noting that um, you, you, you mentioned in Chrome, I think some people are still sort of getting used to the idea of Chrome as a web browser, certainly Internet Explorer, Firefox, very well known. Um, Chrome has really made some amazing leaps and bounds in uh, the, the usage of it uh, that as of right now worldwide, it is uh, the second uh, most popular browser just past Firefox recently. And it's only behind Internet Explorer if you count all the versions of Internet Explorer. If you actually say what is the most popular browser, Chrome is the most popular browser above even IE8. So for a lot of good reasons. It's a secure browser. It's fast. It works great with Google Apps, and it updates automatically. In a school situation, it's, it's a fantastic thing. So we're really excited. So thanks for, for mentioning that. Um, my uh, awesome thing of the week is Google related as well. So we are getting a little bit of a Google overdose here uh, today. But uh, a new thing uh, came out this week, um, and that is stock photos for Google Docs. Now this is, to the best of my knowledge, not really a documented feature. I have not yet, unless I'm mistaken, somebody let me know if you've heard differently, I've not heard Google actually speak to this yet. So I did come across it. I was just putting together a, a, a handout, a help guide on Chrome of all things. And um, I was going to insert some pictures and I went, wait a second, I haven't seen this option before. Uh, basically what happens is, um, one of the concerns people have a lot of times is that Google Docs does not come with clip art like Microsoft, Microsoft Office does. And so I know for a, quite a while, teachers, schools have been asking Google, please provide some sort of a clip art feature. Well, here's the way it works. If you're inside a Google Doc now or Google Presentation or Google Spreadsheet, now it does have to be the new version of the presentation editor. You can't be using the old Google Presentations. But as long as you're in the new version of it, if you go to Insert, let me go to Insert Image, and then what's going to happen is it's going to bring up the normal screen that you're used to seeing where you've got the option to upload an image, to put in a, a web address for an image, to do a Google image search for an image, or to go to your Picasso web albums. Well, you can now see there's an option for stock photos. You can type in something like school or, you know, um, whatever it is you're looking for, and so I type in school and some buses show up. Or maybe I'm doing a, a report on spiders or something like that. I could type in spider and spiders show up. And so basically what it is is uh, some stock images that I'm assuming Google probably purchased 
from uh, some company somewhere that were all indexed and so forth, and they've made this available now so that you can pick your image, select that, and insert that image right into your document or your presentation or your spreadsheet. Uh, so I think it's really a step in the right direction. I'm hoping they expand this. They could certainly use a whole lot more pictures in there, but there definitely are some really good ones in there. They're more toward photographs than they are toward like cartoony clip art. But nevertheless, I'm really glad to see that. I think that's going to help our students and our staff embrace Google Docs even a little bit more. So thanks to Google for that. Uh, Eric G., what do you have for us? Hold, hold on, Eric. There's a spider on the center <laughs> of my screen. Just, nope, that's gone. Okay, never mind. Um, <coughs> for me, yeah. sorry, go ahead, Eric. Well, no, again, if you're not watching the video podcast, you, you're missing out on just some hilarity. So uh, <laughs> be, sure, be sure to check the video version. Go ahead, Eric G. <laughs> gotcha, gotcha. Thank you. Yes. Um, so last week I talked about a uh, keyboard for my iPad. You know, my wife bought me a keyboard. Uh, you know, when the iPad first came out, and that you know helped uh, make the the device popular to me because I I really could not type at all on the iPad. And uh, about let's say a year ago, I started to use an app um, that I found called Tap Typing, and I'll share that here. Um, and what that does is, if I scroll down a little bit here. It allows you, or I guess teaches you, to type on the iPad. It you know makes you memorize muscle memory uh, for your thumbs, your fingers, different things like that. So we just launched a iPad pilot at uh, my school, and one of the challenges that that uh, I'm going to offer to my staff is if they purchase this app and start to learn how to tap type. Uh, not only will that make the iPad a better device for them in the classroom, but I'll give them 25 iTunes dollars if they can beat my tap typing score. Currently, this morning, I was at 52 words per minute with my thumbs typing, you know, like that. Uh, it's also the, uh, worth mentioning that this uh, app helped you get over your phobia of virtual keyboards. This is true. This is true. I, I yeah. hate anything virtual. So, But, yeah, the, the keyboard itself, I mean, it really helped me out as far as typing. Um, so, I mean, it's, and I've heard so many folks say, I can't type on that thing, I can't type on that thing. And if you spend just a little bit of time practicing typing, it really is worth it. There's a free version that's just a test that gives you a couple of samples. And then there's a version that I believe is about $3.99, works on the iPhone, iPad, um, iPod Touch. So, you know, you need to compete with, uh, with those kids in your classroom who already type 60 words a minute with their thumb. So, you know teachers, staff, anyone watching this need to start competing and step up the game. So that app should help you out. So that's all I got. All right. Thanks so much. Uh, uh, Brian and Julie, anything uh, that you wanted to share awesome of the week or any responses to those awesome things of the week? If not, that's okay. All right, all right, no problem at all. All right, guys, well, we're going to go ahead and switch gears now into our main topic uh, for this episode. Um, this is our seventh episode of the State of Tech, and up till now, a lot of the stuff we've been hitting on has been, um, you know, gadgets, and it's been BYOT and Google Apps, and all that's been fantastic. We really enjoyed that, but we've been excited about this upcoming episode because we're really taking a look at curriculum at this point. And so um, our episode today is on using technology for mathematics teaching and learning. And so we hope that this goes well because we'd love to do one on science and one on language arts and one on fine arts and one on social studies and so forth. It'd be great every couple of months to really dig into a curricular area. So as normal, we threw out our, uh, or casted out our survey about a month ahead of time saying, hey, if anybody out there um, is doing um, technology and mathematics, Tell us, tell us what you're doing. And we received uh, dozens and dozens of replies. It was one of our most answered surveys that we've had. And so it was just amazing amount of information. Um, I will say that there's no possible way we're going to cover everything in our episode today that was in that, that came back from that survey. So please do, as always, check out our show notes. We've linked in dozens and dozens and dozens of websites and apps and programs that people said, hey, I use this. I really like this. Uh, we'll definitely mention some of them today as uh, Brian and Julie share and as we talk about things, but we won't be able to get to all of those. So please do check out the show notes and a real big thanks to all the folks who did fill out that survey, including Brian and Julie, which is how we came across these folks. So what we're going to do, we're going to start off with Brian and just give uh, him a chance to tell more information about uh, what he does in his school and really get into, you know, how is Brian using technology and mathematics. So uh, let me turn this over to you, Brian. Go ahead. 
All right. Well, I think it's going to be a little bit of overlap with your uh, tablets in the classroom. I'm uh, one of six teachers that is piloting a, an iPad program in my district. Um, I was given a classroom set of iPads to teach with. And I've, I've had a smart board for years. And before I was chosen, I, I, it's been a goal of mine to become a developer, an app developer on iOS. So I sat down, I worked hard, and figured it out. And I'm, I'm not sure if that was one of the reasons why I'm cho I was chosen out of the group of teachers that filled out our application. I hope so. Um, anyway, so I developed an app for my classroom that I use to push out lessons. Uh, I write them for my smart board and then export them as PDFs. And you know, I have a lot of different functionality that I build into my app. So th that's the main one I use. Uh, there are uh, many others. Uh, Quick Graph is a great app that I like. It, it virtually eliminates the need for a graphing calculator. Um, most of the, we try and stay in my district with free apps, so we use Quick, Quick Graph for our graphing. Uh, I, I don't have a textbook I use. Um, I have the district bought a textbook for as a, just as a guide for me, and it's uh, Math Matters 3 by Glencoe. And there's a lot, there's some websites that that for they use for review with with built in multiple choice quizzes for kids to self check which i use at the end of each chapter and i built that in so my app is kind of like i was looking at flipboard last spring and i thought wow that'd be neat because to develop an app and put everything i'm going to need at the beginning of the year is just it would be hard to do because this is the first year this is a brand new class i'm teaching this year and with the iPads, I don't think I could think of everything in advance. So I built something like Flipboard that goes out and grabs the information from the, the net and brings it back in for me to use. That way I can change it on I, I, in a half an hour if I have to. Um, we also use, uh, and there's been a push in my, our school improvement plan is High Schools at Work. And they are big into educational gaming. So most recently, right before Thanksgiving, I used Angry Birds to teach the parabolic arc formula. And uh, it was a unique experience in that I had uh, more than one student walk in and say, and I've been teaching for almost 20 years, boy, I've been looking forward to this class all day. And uh, I, don't, I don't get that a lot in the math classroom, so uh, I don't, which I don't get, but uh, it, was, uh, it, it was a lot of fun. Uh, I, I did some research and found out that the birds are launched at approximately 72 feet per second, a little more than that. So we tested it to see if it worked. Also in the fall every year, my school gets a 50-foot lift for me to go up on and drop pumpkins from. And I used to do that in my integrated two class, which was the parabolic R formula, but V was equal to zero. So that kind of disappeared. And I was able to link all of that because I have some of my students that I had in Integrated 2 this year in Integrated 3 and bring in the Integrated 2 class and teach the different versions of the, or the different applications of the parabolic R formula if, if it's just a resting object, you know, just a pumpkin being dropped. And we're able to take that video. And, and the neat thing is with the iPads is the kids are able to have that video right there. I embedded it into my app. I dragged it in, into that. And, and they're able to see that and compare it and work on it. Uh, what else? We also use the USA Today, which I've used a little bit, but I will more in the second semester when we get to statistics, because the USA Today app has live um, surveys in, in multiple topics, which is, which is really nice because I was teaching a lesson earlier this year on misleading statistics, and we found one of the surveys, it had a misleading graph built into it, so the students were able to see how even a reputable uh, publication can put something in there that is misleading and it, to me the technology uh, allows me to bring something relevant and current right into the classroom and, and make it and um, make it alive for them. What I also have found with the technology is that the way I see it being used is the the 21st century classroom is everywhere the student goes. Um, they can get their class notes. They take their notes using an app called PaperDesk right on the iPad, and they upload it to their Google Docs, which the school provided for them, or more recently, just added this week for those students who um, have iPhones or iPads, there's now Dropbox support, and I, or even, I, I think it happens on Droid. I don't know. You'll know my bias. Uh, 
towards iOS, but I think I had one or two students even put it on their droids. And they're able to access their notes anywhere. They can sync right to that. And within my own app, I record every lesson that I teach. So if a student needs to review something, they miss something that day, or oh, what do you say about that? They can go right into my app, find that right in the lesson in the video, and, and review. One of the most relevant things I think that I did was I put in push notification. And whenever parents came in, we have an open house at the beginning of the year. One of the first things I said to them, I said, oh, do you have an iPhone or an iPad at home? Oh, yeah. And then we, especially if they had an iPhone, we'd download it right there. And I'd allow, have them ask them to allow push notifications. So a day or two before every test and every quiz, the parents get a little push notification from me saying, hey, there's a quiz or a test tomorrow. Make sure your son or daughter studies. And earlier this year, I had a student come in to me and say, you know, I really don't like you being able to communicate with my parents and give them any kind of information without me being able to filter it. And I had this student last year, so I was able to laugh about it. But uh, I know there's more than one or two of them that uh, it keeps them on edge a little, that uh, their parents know the second, within 30 seconds of me sending out that push notification that the, they're well aware of what's going on in, in class. So that, that's nice, and they can contact me, email me right from my app. Also, in our district, the technology is very useful in that we're, we're, we're seeing a lot of literacy or a big push on to increase that across the curricular, curriculum. And I've noticed my students reading much more this year. After they finish their assignment, they have a few minutes. Um, this is when I don't allow them to play Angry Birds, which isn't very often, they, uh, they can read the USA Today and they can use Flipboard and the most recent survey we saw was that or study is that students in the 11th and 12th grade, which is what I teach, they're supposed to be doing 70% of their reading should be informative, which is what that is. So I've, I've noticed that their vocabulary skills are a little better and just from build in, I don't spend a lot of time on vocab. If a student doesn't know what, I, what I'm saying, we have a dictionary app, they can go in and look it up or even built within iOS, they can go in and tap and hold and, and the dictionary will come up. and if many times if they have a question, I can look at them and say, figure it out. And they become more independent, self-directed learners. One thing that I'm looking forward to, and I noticed from your, I think it was the best of the last podcast, the best gadgets in schools. I have to agree with Sean that the Apple TV, I'm really looking forward to getting one for my classroom. I have a few of them at home, and uh, I have a flat screen TV in my classroom, a, a smaller one. I'm looking forward to getting to getting one of those and, and hooking it up so my students can mirror while I'm up at my smart board or standing next to them using my um, slate that they can mirror and show the other students what they're working on through an app, uh, any of the whiteboard apps, whether it's Adobe Ideas or whatever. I'm really looking forward to that. Um, our director has really been very forward thinking and investing in the technology and being willing to, go, willing to go on a limb and push our treasurer even more and, and saying, yeah, th this, the expenditure will be worth it. Well, that, that is awesome, Brian. Um, if anybody has questions, definitely cue those up for Brian. I'm going to start off real quick by, with just a comment. Uh, would you say it's safe for me to, to, to say that one of the things that it sounds like you're really having success with with your kids is using technology to bring in real-world applications? That, that, that seems to be because you're talking about the, the, the statistics off USA Today. You're talking about going out and dropping pumpkins and actually measuring you know, the, the, the real uh, time it takes for something to fall and hit the ground. Um, because I, I used to teach math as well. Uh, before I was a technology director, I was a 7th se uh, and 8th grade math teacher for 7 years, 13 years I'm ago. sorry. So, yeah. Oh, no. I, I, loved, in middle school. Yeah. I loved it. I absolutely loved it. I did not leave my position as a math teacher to escape that and go into technology. I just also happened to be a crazy big nerd, and it just was a good fit and so forth for me. Uh, but I absolutely loved it. And it, it, you, You're sharing these things, and I'm getting jealous. <laughs> I'm thinking, oh, my gosh, that's so much fun. Uh, I used to teach on the third floor of an old building and when we were teaching um, how to solve equations you know the book always gives you equations like you know 2x equals 14 and obviously you know the answer is 7 and so the kids don't want to take the time to actually divide both sides by 2 because they're like why should I why should I actually 
take the time to do that. I can just tell what the answer is. And that's a good point. Yeah, why should they? So what they need is messy equations. They need messy numbers, things that they can't just do in their head. And a great one is trying to figure out how far up the third floor window is outside our window when I was teaching. And so I would drop things out the window as well. Now I dropped ice cubes out because I figured they'll melt. I don't have to go clean them up and stuff like that. And so the kids would all stand there with stopwatches and I would drop the ice cubes and you know they'd all hit their stopwatch and then we would you know see what time they came up with and average them together to get a pretty decent idea. And we would do several tries until we had a really good idea of how many seconds it took for the ice to hit the sidewalk below. And then we would, we would throw that into the formula, which nobody could just do in their mind. It was too hard. The numbers were too big, even though all it was was you know a simple equation. Uh, so it made me think of that. Would you say that's true, that you're seeing a lot of real world data and real world applications because of the technology in your class? Yes, definitely. We um, Just the other day, I was teaching the quadratic equation, and I <laughs> I had a student uh, who's, it's, I teach at a current technical center, so I have a student who's in cos cosmetology studying, studying to cut hair, and just, when am I ever going to use this? Who's ever going to use this? And I said she wanted to take um, the square root of a rational number and turn it into a decimal and solve it that way. And I said, oh, okay, well, you know, you could do that, but do you really want the engineers who are, who are developing skyscrapers to round? or the, the, the engineers who developed the jet engines to round to the nearest tenth or the nearest hundredth, you know, on the first few floors you might be okay. But if you somehow end up in your life working in the, on the tenth floor or the fiftieth floor or the hundredth floor, do you really want them to have rounded? I don't know, you're probably more likely to fly on a plane, and um, I really don't want them rounding. That is why we don't take the square root of an irrational number, because when you round, you know, Eventually, those thousands add up somewhere. So I, I, I'm seeing that. Uh, where else in my uh, classroom? There's just students who are, are able just to search for things. Uh, hey, what's the answer to that? One thing and I've noticed, and none of my students have them yet. I have an iPhone 4S, and Wolfram Alpha is built into Siri. And um, just the things we're able to, to search and the things that that, that, that is able to do that is built in is it's it's amazing to me. Uh, they're what they're able to do is check any kind of conjecture they have or any kind of uh, guess that they have. They're able just to you know now pinch to the home screen, go to Safari, and and check it, and do a Google search for it. All right. Um, I see Eric G has a question. I'm going to throw one thing out in the middle of that on Wolfram Alpha. Alpha that is one of the uh, websites that came up repeatedly in the survey when we asked people, "What are you using?" Um, that was one that you know five, six, seven, eight people mentioned. And I did want to give a quick quote. Um, one of our uh, respondents, uh, Jeff Schaefer, said, "Quote: I use Wolfram Alpha's website to a great degree." The students are able to concentrate on the concept as opposed to spending much of their time with concepts they have learned in the past in past classes. Instead of spending five minutes factoring a problem, we can use Wolfram for that and get at the concept being taught. So, just another you know plug for that site that you know it is one that math teachers are finding a lot of good uses for. Uh, Eric G, you, you had a question about the iPads. Yes, coming from the uh, the tech director side, um, how many iPads do you have uh, in your classroom? I have 24, and we're limited to 25 um, students per classroom by contractual agreement. So, gotcha. um, they, I only, I, and I can only fit tw 24 students in my classroom. So, that's a other teachers. A couple other have 25. Uh, one has 17. I'm update. I'm in the process of updating them last week and this week to iOS 5. So. Gotcha. And wireless internet uh, throughout your school, I assume, or at least yes. in your room. No, they have it. They just that was the big upgrade when they when they they're doing it right. Um, other than giving us control of the the iPads personally, uh, which they're starting to do now. Um, yeah, that's that's how I'm starting it off. Is uh, it's it's your device. Use it as you wish. Um, but uh, how do they all charge? Um, you have a, a cart. We have or? the Brett, We have the Bretford charge cart with sync. Although I, for future classes when we add that, since iOS 5 has really made them PS, PC free, we're going to just get the charge cards because right. once I have upgraded 
all the carts to iOS 5, it's faster for us to go and just put the password in repeatedly on you know 24 devices than it is to sync it with the MacBook Pro. Gotcha. All right. Thanks. All right. Well, well, Brian, that is fantastic. Uh, we're going to switch gears over to Julie, but uh, jump in at any point here with uh, you know comments and questions that you have a as well. Uh, but Julie, we want to hear from you. We're switching to a more middle school setting now. Why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and what you do? Okay. Um, again, I teach seventh grade pre-algebra in uh, San Diego. And uh, about four years ago, I uh, switched to a more um, traditional, I guess, type junior high school. I was in a um, block schedule before teaching both math and science, and I did a lot of technology integration with the two, um, but then switched schools and was in a five periods a day, 35 students a day, uh, kind of regular, not 35 students a day, excuse me, 35 students in a period, so 100 something, 150 something a day. And our math department was very, um, you know, we're going to do direct instruction Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, test on Friday. And uh, after my first year, I was a little frustrated with um, with my what I got out of my students. I wasn't pleased with the way we did things. So I kind of wanted to look to some of the technology I had. And my goal over the last three years has really been removing that uh, myself actually from the front of the room and trying to be involved with my students more and using technology to do that. Um, so I started, uh, I wanted to get my students more engaged in the math, moving around the room. I mean, middle school students cannot sit still for more than 10 minutes at a time, so expecting them to sit for 50 minutes at uh, a period five, six hours a day was just insane. So. Um, I started something. I'm going to try to share a video. Or I'm not sure how this will work, but we'll give it a shot. Um, I wanted my students to be um, moving around the room a little more. So I started something called Station Days. And I'm going to wait and see if this comes up. And Station Days are kind of like the um, like elementary school centers. and. What it basically does is I use the technology to engage two to three groups. Sometimes students will be up at the interactive whiteboard, maybe on a website, um, Brain Pop, or an interactive website. Another group I might have back using iPod Touch devices. Um, and then what that allows me is to have another small group working uh, with me on um, on things that they need. So I actually get to talk to every student in the class. I get to find out where they're having problems while the other students are um, kind of engaged with um, engaged with the math. And I, I don't want to say being babysat. Uh-oh. Did I lose you guys? Um, I don't want to say being babysat, but um, kind of uh, staying focused on math while I get to give my students some more individual attention. So these station days worked really well with um, large groups of students, me giving more personal time. And um, along with that, I wanted to um, I wanted to also get my advanced students more engaged. So I started a program called Fast Track. And um, my Fast Track program would be that if a student, um, if a student scores a 90% or higher, then they're dismissed from the daily uh, classwork. And they get to go work on projects outside of, um, outside of the classroom. So this basically worked on, like, here, here's a computer, go and uh, find a real world application to whatever we're doing. But then the students started like wanting to do projects and, and fun things. So we did a, um, so they started actually like making um, keynotes or PowerPoints that I would then sync to the iPod touch devices and that would be one of the stations. So students were actually using the technology at the stations that were created by some of their um, 
some of their colleagues or their peers in their class. Um, I'm going to try to show you. Did that other video come up? Okay. I'm going to try to show you one of um, the projects that a group of my students did. And I love these movies that they make because uh, it reinforces the concept, reinforces vocabulary. And you'll be able to see these are actually two uh, language learners. So for them to be talking and um, doing math like this is, for me, it's pretty cool. So let me see if I can pull this up and play their little movie for you. Proportions by Dayoon Han and Anna Fung. Key words. Proportions and equality of two ratios. For example, 6, 9 equals 8, 12. You can use the multiplication property of equality to show an important property of all proportions. Cross product. If 6, 9 equals 8, 12, the product of 6 and 12 is the same as the product of 9 and 8. 6, 9 equals 8, 12. 6 times 12 equals 9 times 8. Example 1. Dealing with only numbers is also part of the pattern. 2 8 equals 4 16. 2 times 16 equals 32. 4 times 8 equals 32. 32 equals 32. Example 2. Dealing with variables. x a equals b c. x times c equals x c. a times b equals a b. x c equals a b. Our own example. Our own example is the basketball court and Anna. The basketball's hoop height is x and the shadow is 172 centimeters. Anna's shadow is 180 centimeters and her height is 169 centimeters. Now we can use the similar triangles and set up a proportion to point x. The basketball's hoop's height is x and x is 443.2. So the basketball hoop is 443.2 centimeters tall. Okay, so um, these are the kind of movies uh, my Fast Track students would produce, and we would then sync them either to a website or the iPod Touch, and students as part of station days or part of instruction days would actually listen to them, write the problems down, and it would be part of their um, part of their 15-minute station within the classroom. So um, after doing a lot of movies like that, I still... I wanted it to be more for my other students, so we engaged the other students in not quite as uh, detailed. You know, those those students spent a significant amount of time on that with the um, with putting that together. But we do simple ones where we just create keynotes or powerpoints in math in a math topic and create movies, and students have to write the scripts and reinforce the vocabulary, which which they have a lot of fun with. Um, so then this year, um, I'm still trying to actually, you know, it sounds horrible, but not stop teaching, but um, really give students a chance to be in charge of their, you know, I look at my 10-year-old son who, when he wants to learn something, he's, you know, he Googles it. He's like, you know, kids don't ask you anymore. Uh, is, you know, what is the answer to this question? They ask you, is it true that? Because they've Googled it, they've looked it up, and they want you to verify their um, understanding, not necessarily tell you the answer. So this year I've started um, flipping my classroom. Uh, my district, as, as much as I love Apple, I'm in a, uh, I'm in a, I'm in a, uh, I'm, I'm in a one-to-one uh, -one program with uh, Lenovo uh, Netbooks, so I'm doing my best to, uh, to yeah, I know, I'm very, oh yeah, <laughs> I get a thumbs up from some of you. Anyway, so um, I, I still have my MacBooks and my iPods and all my uh, stuff, but uh, I use my uh, Netbooks for actually flipping my classroom. And what that means is, you know, I almost lost you guys the last time. I'm almost afraid to go to one of my screencasts, but I'm going to give it a shot. Hi, guys. Today we're going to be talking about fractions. Let's start with discussing equivalent fractions. You should have learned a lot of this in elementary school, but we're just going to do a brief review. These are fraction bars in front of us. I can see that this right here represents one-half, and that one-half is also the same 
as a fourth and a fourth, which we could say two-fourths. So one-half is the same as two-fourths. I could also look at my eighths. Eighths, 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 eighths. One-half here is the same as one, two, three, four, eighths. We call these equivalent fractions. When I work with fractions, I like to think of them as the same. One-half is the same as two-fourths. Two-fourths is the same as four-eighths. They just look a little different. Um, basically, what, I, what I've done is this uh, right here is my, I have a Promethean board in my classroom. And I have lessons that are, um, I have, you know, Promethean lessons already created. And I use the screen capture on my Promethean lessons to, uh, I, I basically teach my lesson as it records um, me teaching. And I assign this for homework. So the students are actually getting my direct instruction piece at home um, while, that, and that's their homework. So it'll be like, okay, today we're doing divisibility rules and simplifying fractions. Um, I teach them how I would in the class. I say, pause the movie now and try these two examples, and then I'll continue teaching the lesson. And then I'll say, pause the movie again and bring these five examples into class tomorrow. So then what that does, I, I, my first thing, I was absolutely amazed that usually my 40 to 40 five minute lessons are shrink down to like seven or eight minutes, you know? When you get rid of the stop tapping your pencils on the table, no, you can't go to the bathroom, stop talking. When you get rid of all those distractions, your lessons really narrow down to a small chunk of time. So we do that at home, and they come to class, and some of them, you know, in a perfect world, they would all do their homework, but we know they don't. So some of them actually come to class, and they do not get their initial uh, points for watching the screencast. The ones that did watch it, I can check their answers. And if they got it right, then they actually go on to actually doing their homework in class or um, do a few problems and then go on and work on some fun projects in class that, you know, they don't necessarily need to do all 20. And then other students can come up to the board with me and we actually identify where they made their mistakes in those problems I asked them to do. And I have a nice small uh, group where I'm doing a real quick instruction piece and then um, they work on things in class. So that's basically where I am. We still do our station days where we move around and I work with small groups. We do the instruction piece at home with our um, with the screencasts and um, we're having a lot of fun. In fact, I, I find myself, if I'm stuck in front of the room talking to the kids for 10 minutes, I feel like I'm wasting my time. My advanced kids are bored, my lower kids are lost, my middle kids probably want me to stop talking at some point. And so um, that's what I'm trying to do by using technology in my math classroom. Well, <clears throat> that, that is fantastic. Um, and uh, yeah, flipping is really becoming something that we're hearing an awful lot more about. Uh, I was just at a um, session the other day down at the county office where they were talking about the flip classroom. And it's something that some of our teachers are experimenting with here as well. Sounds like you're doing an awesome job with that. That is, that is really, really exciting. Um, guys, any, any, I think there was a question. Eric, you had one. I saw. Yes. What was your question? Yeah, uh, my question was for Julie, or is for Julie. Uh, what software did you use, uh, or did your students use to create those? Was that the, the basketball court one? Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, we used quite a few. It was actually a PowerPoint started that we um, kind of uh, like. Um, PowerPoint, or if it's in school, my students use Keynote, but I think that's a PowerPoint template because they did that first piece at home. Um, and then we take those, either PowerPoint JPEG, or excuse me, Keynote, we exported them as JPEGs, and then we drug them into iMovie. And then as far as the um, basketball court, the picture, that was a screen capture using the Promethean software. So I sent the girls out to the basketball hoop. They took a picture and then insert, imported the picture as a background and then used the Promethean software tools to draw the triangles and the screen recorder to actually record themselves drawing the similar triangles and solving the problem. Hmm. 
And then I see a question, have you found motivating students? Um, Oh, as far as the, okay, I'll read the question. So, have you found motivating students difficult? And are there a large number of students not watching the videos? Um, as far as motivating the students, difficult, no. I think students are actually more motivated uh, because they know that I will be walking around the classroom harassing them every day. It's, you know, I'm going to be, you didn't watch the video. It's very clear that you didn't watch the video. Or, um, you know, I'm, you, you teach middle school, you got to get the whip out, and so we, you know, they walk in without their video notes, we call home, we make sure that they look like um, not the model citizen we want them to be. I, I don't know. I probably average uh, three to four kids out of 32, 33 that don't watch the video. So it's, it's actually pretty good. It started rough, you know, and, and it started, I was like, you know what, no video, you got sounds horrible, but I made them go sit on the floor. I'm like, you're not part of the class today. You don't have your, we have carpet floors. It's not that horrible. But um, <laughs> anyway, I said, go sit on the floor. You know, try to make them, you know, make it very clear what the classroom expectations were. And I think they really appreciate uh, the one-on-one -on -one time. Uh, I mean, I literally can say that out of 32, 33 students, I, I talk to every student two to three times in a 54-minute period. And that, in a direct instruction approach to teaching math, is, you know, it, it's very difficult to do. You know, your, your kids want to answer the questions all the time. They're usually not the kids that really need the help. And the lower kids you never get to. It, it's just, it's been a big turnaround. And I'm fortunate that my kids can watch the videos at home because we are one-to-one -one and they take the laptops home. But my first three weeks of school, I wanted to teach them how to use the screencasts. Um, you know, as a learning tool, so we did it in class. And uh, even if I didn't have the laptops that go home, I would probably use screencasts instead of direct instruction um, almost as much as possible, you know, just by having them plugged in, focused. Um, you know, when we did it at the beginning of the year, students could work through the videos at their own pace. So if somebody knew the answers already, they could fast forward the video, just solve the problem, show me, and move on with their lives. And then the ones that needed a little more time, I could come over and work with. And others, I would just say, you know what, rewind and watch it again. I think you need to see it. So it really differentiates the classroom, even if you're just doing screencasts in the classroom. Well, that, I really appreciate it. That, that is really awesome. Um, for those that aren't familiar with flipping, uh, you're going to be hearing about it more and more and more. I think uh, we would love to do a uh, episode just about flipping uh, for the state of tech. And for what it's worth, um, we'll move on to some more math stuff here, but just uh, throw a plug out there for it. If you're trying to wrap your brain around flipping, think about it this way. English teachers or reading teachers have always been doing this. Um, they'd say, go home tonight and read the next chapter of Huck Finn and then come in tomorrow and we're going to discuss it. Um, you know, that's flipping the class because they're getting, you know, the content outside of the class, then they're getting the valuable interaction during the class. The problem is it's harder to do that with math. It's a skill subject. It's harder to do that with other things. And so that's where the technology has come in to let the idea of what reading teachers have been doing for years now start being used in math and science and other things like that because you can record the the content, the instruction, and then save the class time for the valuable one-on-one -on -one interaction helping the students. So, um, you know, really a, a great philosophy. I'm glad to see you doing it as a math teacher because I typically hear it coming from science teachers. And so that, that that's great to hear that from math. Um, well, we are going to move on to our third vir our virtual guest uh, now, uh, which is uh, a gentleman named Jeff Berkebile, who could not be with us today, but what he had to share was just uh, so exciting that I'm uh, making him an honorary guest. Um, and so uh, let me uh, pull up my screen here for, uh, for, for Jeff. He's uh, from Louisville City Schools, so here's, here's his school district here. And um, I'm just going to go ahead and share real briefly what it was that uh, Jeff shared with me. Um, and uh, if you guys end up having questions, I don't know that if we can actually answer any of them because Jeff's not here, but uh, maybe there'll be something in the notes he gave me that I can refer to. But uh, he's a math teacher as well, but a third grade math teacher. So now we get to take math all the way down to the elementary level and see what sort of things are happening in there. So here's what, here's what he shared. Basically, he is trying to do a 21st century 
paperless math classroom with third graders. Uh, that's, that's pretty exciting. Basically, uh, it is, again, a one-to-one -one program, so each student does have a computer while they're there in his class. Uh, here's, here's what he had to share. I'll pretty much ju just read his words since he says it best. Um, he said, uh, um, I secured a set of 20 used Dell, uh, Dell Latitude laptops for each student through a donor. So he was able to get these through a donor, very creative. All of the lessons are presented through PowerPoint and reviewed with pre-made e-instruction lessons that I created or create after reviewing a skill or an assessment. I use the interactive whiteboard. He uses a, uh, a, a Mimeo, is the brand that they use. Uh, he uses that with students to review. The students are engaged because they know that they get to go to the board and use the magic pen, as he puts it. Uh, after presenting the lessons, uh, he creates journals to allow the students to use the lessons vocabulary and problems and examples. The journals are created using Word, and he saves them in what he calls the form format. That's where you can actually have boxes that people can type in in those spots so they can fill in answers but not actually alter the original document, kind of like a, 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 a template, I guess, would be the way of saying that. Uh, during the week, he uses uh, CPS, that's like uh, clickers, um, to check their progress in certain skills. Uh, he, says, he says, I also use a Mobi tablet to allow students to work problems at their desks on the interactive whiteboard. The Mobi also allows me to monitor their answers to the CPS questions and gain valuable and immediate feedback. Um, the student's homework is also created in electronic media, again, using Word to create forms. Now, here's where he gets into a little more detail about something I'll pull up on the screen called Edmodo. Now, I don't know if you guys are familiar with Edmodo or not, but it's sort of like a, um, uh, a learning management system that um, is a little social in nature, but uh, kind of think about maybe, I don't know, if it's fair to say a light version of Moodle, something kind of like that. Um, but uh, he says the students, um, he posts all of this stuff on Edmodo during the day. And it's a free service, by the way. Um, I know one of our teachers uses it at, the middle school, at our middle school. The students then go home, they download the assignment, complete it, and upload it back to the Edmodo Dropbox. And then I can check their homework prior to the next day, which allows me to review items they didn't understand and not waste time on the items they understood. And you can see on the Edmodo side here, I'm logged in as just a demo student of his. He, he let me uh, get into his site. And you'll see that he'll have like a, a worksheet, and they can go in and click on the worksheet to download it. It'll then open up in Word, and they can fill it all in. And once they save it, then there's a turn-in box they can click on here to submit that back to him, and then he can grade all of that. There's also quizzes they can take, and you can see the students can leave comments, and he can leave comments, and they can chat back and forth through this. So this is his online uh, component that he's using for his class to achieve what, what he's doing. Um, so anyway, uh, he goes on to say that Emoto also allows him to answer uh, any homework questions that the children have after they get home. I have a set window of time that they can ask questions and will get a reply. The extra hours are from 3 to 7, so the students have access to their teacher for an extra 4 hours. So he's kind of got like virtual office hours. The kids can go on and ask questions during that time. <laughs> says, I also house the PowerPoints and journals on Edmodo for their access any time. Um, speaking of assessments, the students complete assessments that I've created on Study Island and Ed Edmodo. Uh, both of these grade the tests for him, and they give him the opportunity to immediately know the area of weaknesses um, or, or the concepts or skills. Uh, on days the students are assessed, I'm able to spend the remaining math class uh, doing examples from the assessment. In past practice, it may have taken me a day or two to grade an assessment, and by then the students are already on to another skill. Now I have immediate feedback. Uh, he finishes up by saying that he uses Study Island to create lessons for kids that have shown weaknesses in specific areas and assign it just to that student. And he also uses Brain Pop, uh, which we have a subscription for that as well in our district. He says, I found uh, the videos to be very useful to drive home a point, and the students love the short videos. Um, Speaking of equity, because I know that that does come up, he says of the 19 students, 14 of them have internet access at home. So paperless is not a problem for them. The other five, basically, he just got a little flash drive for them, provided it to them. They go home with it already, with the assignment already downloaded onto the flash drive. They complete it at home. When they come back in, then they upload it to Edmodo so it can get put into the system with, with the rest of them. Um, 
He says that we've, they've had a couple of technical issues, um, but nothing they couldn't work through. To date, there has not been any negative feedback. And the only paper he uses is scrap paper that he collects from the copier and that the students use to work out answers on paper. So just a, a really, really neat thing that at the third grade level with these kids, what he's been able to accomplish in a paperless classroom using Edmodo, using uh, clickers, using BrainPop, just using just about any possible tool you could think pulling them together to do that. And I thought that was really neat. Uh, what do you guys think about that? Who's, who's got, I saw some comments popping up there. I'll let you guys jump in. I'm actually uh, <clears throat> waiting. We, I, I just reviewed Edmodo, and I'm actually waiting for Google Plus to come out. I know we can sign up for it to use, uh, you know, in my my school, but you know, it's only for what 18 and up. Is not that right, Eric? Yeah. Yeah, so. that that is correct. Uh, Google Plus probably will eventually get um, will be made available to schools K-12, but um, I, I still don't have any you know guarantee as to when that will be. They've got to work out some issues with the 18 and under option mm -hmm. there. Yeah. Yeah, because I mean, with with like Edmodo, they sign up themselves, right? To uh, for the account, you know, you can't. Um, there's no like management console, right? I, I can't. Um, you know, and, and I feel bad. I should be able to tell you everything about Edmodo because one of our teachers uses it. Um, I'll put a link um, in the show notes to some more information from her on that because she wrote up a little article about it. Um, but no, I believe she manages her students through okay. Edmodo. Yeah. But see, you know, with, with Google, if they already have a Google account, you know, Google Apps account, I'd love for that to just automatically be transferred over through Google+. Plus. So really, that's, that's what I'm waiting on. But, you know, it, that concept of uh, a learning management system or a content management system, that is something that's, uh, that's great. Uh, it's definitely necessary um, when you're doing a one-to-one -one solution or uh, bring your own tech or something like that, so... Yeah, it, it does seem to I me. Mean, it kind of makes me think a little bit about Brian's, uh, you know, Foudy app that he created. You know, that it's it's the thing to tie it together to help give consistency and to pull all the information together. So whether it's something like Edmodo or Brian's app that he put together, or a website that you run, or you know, a blog or whatever it is, having something that is you know virtual, something that's cloud based, something that extends the learning outside of the of the math classroom and gives you know, so it could be Moodle, it could be Sakai. It could be Open Class from 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 Pearson that Google now is using. It could be Edmodo. It could be an app. But it's having some place, some way to extend the learning outside of the traditional classroom. Seems to be where we're seeing these amazing innovations in math, and that's that's really exciting. Um, all right. Um, anybody else? We're going to start wrapping up the big discussion portion of it and we're going to shift some gears into a real quick I'm just going to pretty much run down the list of the websites of many of the websites that got shared through the survey and just give you guys a chance to say hey I've used that or that's a that's a neat one all of these are linked in on the show notes but before I make that turn uh, Brian Julie anybody else have a question about uh, anything that's come up so far here today all right. Actually, I, I would like to thank um, uh, thank you guys today for justifying uh, Angry Birds. So uh, you know, <laughs> to totally going to buy that with a gift card uh, for my treasure. So thank you. Well, no, I mean that it, it actually, but then that's the thing. There are so many ways you can use technology, and I think we could talk forever about it. But just that one as an example is is a perfect way to, to show that that yeah, you can you can turn just about anything into that. Uh, one way that we uh, got our administrators to buy in was they all got, of course, got their own iPads, and our treasurer loves his, and uh, I, I show him all the time. Matter of fact, this weekend he's buying an Apple TV because of all the stuff I've told him you could do with it, and the mirroring and, and everything, uh, and FaceTime. So, it, it, and through iCloud, how we're able to share um, to-do lists with the Reminders app. So, mm -hmm. get, yep. you know, yep. I would, no, I would I, recommend getting your treasure an iPad or something. I, I, I did, I did. So, uh, it's the gift cards, it's the buying of apps now that, that we're working on, so, yeah. And I just wanted to jump in and say real quick that you know there are else. <laughs> can, can you guys hear me? Yes. Okay. You know there are other apps besides yes. Angry Birds. Yes. You know, like uh, <clears throat> excuse me, for example, <clears throat> Cut the Rope. I know is is a really good physics-based game. Also, Jelly Car. So you know you can tie in those fun games 
like Angry Birds, you know, it doesn't necessarily have to be just a quote unquote math app. It's, right, it's right. Plants, there's, a, there's also plants. a fun one called Flight Control HD, which I haven't figured out which math lesson I'm going to tie that to, but it's more geometric based. That How about Plants vs. Zombies? Can you tie that one in? Because I have an addiction issue with that. So I've never played uh, it. So I, I we'll can try. Say I'd, be more, I'd, I'd try Real Racing HD first. <laughs> gotcha. All right. Well, uh, we'll go ahead now and, and turn that corner to some uh, just a, a real quick blitz of resources here. Uh, so what we've done in our show notes is I've tried my best to divide up the uh, the different um, resources that were shared into a couple of categories. Um, and so the first one we're going to go with is video tutorials and instructions. Um, and so what you'll see, let me go ahead and pull that up. There we go. Um, we've got a couple of pretty heavy hitters that you hear a lot of in the uh, video tutorials and video instruction area. The first one is Khan Academy. Hearing a lot of people that they recommended that during our survey. Uh, the next one that showed up a lot was Brain Pop, and that is one that we do use in our district as well. That one is subscription service. I should mention Khan Academy is not. That is free. Brain Pop is a, a subscription service. One that you might not know as much about, Scholastic puts out one called Study Jams, which has lots of really cute animated videos as well. Uh, and that one is free. There's not a, a cost involved in that. And then uh, another one that I saw come up, I have, don't have any experience with it myself, but it really looked in, in interesting, was called ShowMe.com. And I guess there's an app that goes along with this. And it basically allows you to make your own little instructional screencasts right there on the iPad, and then you can very easily share them. Um, so if you're looking for a way to get the kids to do what Julie was talking about, I think that would be another really good one. So um, anybody have anything to say about that little batch there before we move on to the next category? My district uses um, a whiteboard app called EduCreative. It just came out and it also allows to create a video. That is how I plan on uh, teaching my lessons by taking screenshots of them on my iPad and then recording it and posting to my website when I have an unexpected absence due to a child illness or something. Um, All right. Uh, can, who else? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, the Khan Academy uh, videos, you know, they have a, a large amount of videos for instruction. Uh, they also have a, a practice section that a lot of people may not know about. And you can have your students sign up for it, and you can actually be their coach. So you'll have a username within the Khan Academy, and students work from the basics of addition, and they can go all the way, they can go up to calculus if they want to. And they basically gives them 10 questions that they have to answer, and they have to get all 10 done in a done correctly to make it through the streak and then they get to move on to the next level. One, one day I had a student come into class saying, um, Ms. Garcia, I was up you know, till 2 in the morning doing trigonometry last night in a pre-algebra class, which is kind of crazy. But anyway, they do these 10 problems and if they don't get the questions, they can then, it links them directly to one of the Colin Academy videos so that they can watch the video and then go back and continue to answer the questions. So the Khan Academy is not just a collection of videos at all also has some interactive practice, which is all free. All right, Sean? Um, I was actually going to just mention another screen capture or screencasting app for uh, the iPad. There's one called ScreenChomp, which is put out by TechSmith, who makes uh, Jing and Camtasia. So you might want to check that one out as well, and it's free. All right. Well, uh, the next category of... Um, websites, I guess pretty much these are at this point, was math, games, practice activities, quizzes, things like that. So let me go ahead and pull up these. Um, and again, these are just things people shared through the survey. Uh, you may be aware of these. If not, uh, definitely check out the show notes to get the exact link. The first one is called Archademic Skill Builders, not academic. It's like arcade, like games. So ArcademicSkillBuilders.com. Uh, uh, another one that came up a lot was free rice, which I know I've played with with my kids, my, with my boys uh, at home as well. Whereas you answer questions, actual physical real rice is donated to world hunger relief programs for everyone you answer, so you can help feed the world while answering uh, math questions and other problems as well. Uh, the next one up um, was called MathPlay.com. Uh, that got shared with us. Uh, CoolMath.com is certainly very well known. I know my boys are on that all the time at home. They really enjoy that. It's got games that are somewhat, um, you know, 
arcade style games, but also math oriented games as well. And then the last one was called thatquiz.org, where you just have lots and lots and lots and lots of math quizzes that you can take online. Uh, so that was sort of the category of games, practices, and quizzes. Anybody have anything to respond to any of those before I move on? All right, very good. Uh, the next category uh, was learning and assessment systems. So for that one, let me go ahead and pull these guys up. We've got about uh, six or so of these that got shared with us through the survey. Um, there we go. Get that up on the screen for us. The first one is called um, Extra Math, and this one is free, extramath.org. This is one that our school district uses. I know my third grade son comes home and wants to play on Extra Math, and it does. It gives them um, some, some tutorials and gives them chances to go through and try out uh, the math uh, skills and work their way up through all the different math skills. Um, then there's one called 10 Marks, and that one is free as well, 10marks.com. Um, and that likewise has instruction and tutorials and help, and then the students can work through and practice their skills. The next few of them, though, are fee-based. Um, we've got uh, one called IXL, like the letter I-X-L, um, but uh, IXL.com. And then there's one called Alex, A-L-E-K-S, Alex.com, followed by um, another one called Math Facts in a Flash. And then finally, the last one that got shared was Study Island. We heard that come up a couple of times here and there. So all of these are more geared to being a managed, organized students log in sort of thing and move through some sort of a structured program to give them some guidance and some assessment to see how they're doing. Uh, anybody have uh, any experience with any of those? No? All right. My kids have used definitely have check fun. those out. Yeah. Okay. And they basically um, and, enjoy it. Yeah. And then the last one I'm going to throw out here, there's many, many more than this. Please check the show notes. It was a category that I just called Math Tools, Interactives, and Virtual Manipulatives. And so uh, some of the big ones that got shared from that was, of course, the National Library of Virtual Manipulatives. I remember that being around when I was teaching many years ago and really liked that if you want to have virtual versions of your normal math uh, items like pattern blocks and, and all those sort of things. Um, another one that came up was Fluidity software that makes a program called Fluid Math. I can't speak to it, but we did have a pretty nice uh, uh, paragraph shared by one of our um, survey takers. And what she said was, uh, the most impactful software we are now using is called Fluid Math. This software actually lets them bring math to life. They can play with math to get an understanding of it in a way that previously wasn't readily accessible. Basically, the software is a graphing calculator that recognizes your handwriting. So instead of getting caught up in the mechanics of how to work the calculator, you simply write your equations and modify your equations, and it graphs it for you on the fly. You can also use it in physics to illustrate or animate examples you draw. For example, draw a car on a straight road, write the equation for velocity, and then have it animate the car based on the equation. It's amazing. So that was one of the uh, resources shared with us. Another one that came up a couple of times was GeoGebra. It's like algebra with geometry mixed together, geogebra.org. And, and this is a lot like um, if you've used... Uh, uh, I'm going to forget the name of it now, uh, Geometer Sketchpad. That was the one that kind of blazed the trail for that. This is totally web-based, though. It's got all the same tools. You can create points and lines and angles and measure them and manipulate them and move them. Great, great interactive geometry tool. Runs right in your browser. And, of course, Wolfram Alpha came up a lot in that category also of math tools, interactives, and so forth. Uh, comments on any of those guys? I love that right. uh, virtual library of uh, manipulatives. That's one of my favorite websites, and I taught uh, fourth and fifth grade math, and I used it, and uh, the students loved it. Well, definitely be sure to, like I say, check the show notes for the rest. We've got another category on interactive whiteboard math resources, teacher tools, worksheets and lessons, iOS apps, and on and on and on. So there's a lot more than we can possibly cover here. But uh, let's have a, a last call then for math. Uh, anybody have any uh, final comments or questions or uh, another nugget that you'd like to throw out about technology and mathematics? Well, one, not necessarily for mathematics, but because we did talk about iPads a lot, um, it, it's a kind of an iOS app. Um, 
if the Apple TV, you know, works well if you can, you know, connect it to a projector with HDMI or a television with HDMI or, a, um, yeah, HDMI. Um, but if you can go the other way, if you can take the iPad and remote control your computer, uh, much like the way the Mobi works, um, except, you know, the iPad would be a better product. Um, any one of those remoting apps, um, I my staff uses Log Me In actually to to remote into their computers. It's a pretty expensive app, but we got a pretty good uh, deal on it. Um, but I know there's uh, quite a few that allow for remote desktop uh, capabilities. So using your iPad as a you know tablet, uh, remote tablet, or like a Slate, um, something like that. Splash Top, yes. Splash Top is one that that we did use. Uh, it, it kind of works the same. It, it's like, uh, well, yeah, you, uh, Julie knows what it is, but um, it'll allow you to overlay, you know, and write over top of your screen. Um, so it's a nice, nice feature. Nice app, just to add to the list. All right. Anything else for the good of the cause before we start to wrap things up? Looks good. All right. Well, I absolutely want to thank uh, Julie and Brian for being with us today. I uh, really appreciate you guys taking the time to share your experiences and your expertise. And uh, um, I, uh, thanks to Jeff as well, who couldn't be with us, but I hope uh, hope uh, you're doing excellent down the hall in the gymnasium with your wrestling tournament. And uh, really exciting to hear what he shared about their third graders. And we want to mention real quick some upcoming episodes. Uh, two weeks from uh, this podcast on December 30th, we'll have a special episode. We'll be doing our technology predictions for the new year. So uh, Sean, Eric, and I will be taking a look at uh, what we think uh, will be happening in educational technology in the next year. It should be a, a fun show. Uh, and then the two shows following that are going to be sort of a, a part one, part two. Uh, on January 14th and on January 28th, we're going to be taking a look at interactive whiteboards. Um, Real popular topic. Lots of folks are either using interactive whiteboards or hoping to be able to get them for their classrooms. And so we thought we really should take a look at that in uh, two separate parts. Uh, the January 14th episode, we're going to be focusing on simply comparing the different systems that are out there. Smartboard, Promethean, Polyvision, uh, Mimeo, um, the Brightlink, all these new options that, that are out there just to get a better idea of what they are, uh, what are the pros and cons of each of them so people have a better idea of uh, making choices about interactive whiteboards. The following episode then on January 28th, part two of that, we're really going to be looking at the uses of the whiteboards, the curricular uses. What are some of the best ways that these are getting used in classrooms so they're not just a glorified chalkboard? You know, how are people actually transforming the way um, subject matters being taught in the classroom by using these interactive whiteboards. So uh, please look for the uh, survey on the website as usual. If you are in any way using an interactive whiteboard system in your room, we want to hear from you. Which one do you use? Why do you like it? What's the challenge about it? But also most importantly, how is it transforming your classroom? What are you doing different in your classroom because you have that? So those will be some of the upcoming episodes that we are looking forward to doing. Um, I'm going to go ahead and uh, uh, give this back to Eric G to wrap things up with a little look at some listener feedback, which we always appreciate, and then just some final reminders on how to uh, uh, contact us. Eric G, take yes. us out. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, just a one listener feedback, or I'm sorry, two listener feedbacks. Um, one is from iTunes. Um, we have a person, it's an unnamed person, says, pros, if you are in any way involved with technology in education, you won't want to miss these guys. Interesting, experienced, and funny. I'm assuming they're talking about not Sean. Um, they will teach you a great deal about using technology in the classroom. So thank you. We love iTunes feedback. Um, also, have your wife was uh, on iTunes again. <laughs> I was going to say the next one's from Sean's mother, so I'm not quite sure if I want to read that, but we'll, we'll skip that one. So uh, yeah, uh, then we got an email from Karen. Uh, how do you say the last name again? Smetzer. Smetzer, yes. And uh, she says, thanks for providing the video episodes to all the tech topics. We're enthusiasts for your work. So Karen's from Cincinnati Hills Christian Academy, and we thank you for your feedback. Um, some final final thoughts here. The uh, First of all, we'd like to thank, thank everybody for listening or watching or both 
uh, our podcast at the State of Tech here today. Uh, there are a few ways to contact us. One is by phone. We have a Google Voice account. It's 513-318-TECH. You can also send us a uh, you can also send us an email at thestateoftech at gmail.com. We also have a State of Tech page at uh, Google+, and uh, we should put that on the uh, website and in the show notes. Um, we also have a Twitter account. It's at the State of Tech. So don't forget to watch our up-and-coming shows. Uh, you can always find our shows at thestateoftech.org. Uh, again, please leave us a comment on our blog, on the uh, on iTunes, any way you can comment or give us a message. We'll gladly listen and you know might even read your comment on the show. Um, lastly, this has been the State of Tech. We will see you in another two weeks for another episode of the State of Tech.